So this morning, I'd like to share with you just a, a, a few things. We've, we've been in a different time. And I thought, what are some things that I've learned through this time? As Pastor Peter asked me a couple weeks ago, he says, uh, would you mind speaking? And I just automatically said yes. And then I thought about it. And it's like, wow. Okay. So uh, uh, I'm going to share with you just the, these come from some things that uh, I personally have just gone through during the course of uh, our COVID trip. So in the beginning of it, like most, uh, the, the unknown was uh, seen with a bit of fear, followed by a bit of anxiety. And then next thing I know, I, I find out that I'm feeling a little down. And after a couple weeks, I said, that's enough of this. I need to get to the place where I need to be to look for the answers for this thing. And so I'm going to share with you today some things that I've learned from the word on how to cope with COVID-19. So let's just uh, open with a word of prayer and we shall begin. Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness to us. And today, Lord, as I go and just to have the privilege of being able to share your word, I pray that the words that I share would bring honor and glory to your name, that your Holy Spirit would work in the hearts of your people and those who are listening, and I pray, God, that your word would, would shine bright and clear, and uh, you would give me clarity of thought today so that I would be able to uh, just help others to be able to navigate through this time, that, this unfamiliar time that we are in. And so we thank you for the privilege to be able to come together here today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And Eric's told me I have to stay fairly still. It's going to be hard. But, you know, there was a young boy. He was 13 years old. His name was John Nicholson. I don't know if you're familiar with that name or not, but he went, and he went up to his mom and he went and he said, Mom, I'd like a Bible. This was back in the 1880s. And his mom went and said to him, she goes, Son, I will share my Bible. I am going to give you my Bible, but under one condition. And that condition is, is that you read this Bible every day. It was a promise he had to make. And he fulfilled that promise for 73 years. That man later in his life, as he grew older, became a traveling salesman. And one night he, he arrived at Briscoe Bell, Wisconsin, at the Central Hotel. When he got there, it was extremely full that night, and he met another gentleman. They had one double bed left. The two of them agreed. He was a salesman as well. Okay, we'll share the room. And they got together, and as they began to, to get to know each other, they realized that they both had the same faith. But not only did they have the same faith, but they also had the same dream. Both of them desired to get the word of God throughout the world through some kind of organization. And that night in a hotel in Bosco Bell, Wisconsin, in 1898, the Gideon organization was started and today has distributed 1.7 billion Bibles billion Bibles around the world. And why do I tell you this? Because I quickly realized when this pandemic started that once again, the answers to life are found here in God's word, in his Bible. Okay. The answer, you, Doug Ford didn't mention it. Justin Trudeau hasn't credited it. Teresa Tam hasn't suggested it, and the World Health Organization hasn't mandated it. No one, no one on that TV, as of yet, I have seen. Now, maybe somebody has, but it's suggested that maybe we should go to the Word of God. Maybe we should look to God and to His Word, the giver of life, for those answers that we need. You see, 
I was given this back in 1999 by a Murray McIsaac as I pastored out in Fielding, New Brunswick. And this, the blue ones, are a pastor's Bible. And when you open it, it's, it has these words in it. It says this book. This book reveals the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It's the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's character. Here too, heaven is open and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good its design, and the glory of God its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, prayerfully. It's a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. It is given you in life, will be opened at the judgment, and be remembered forever. It involves highest responsibility, re will reward the greatest labor, and condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. Owned it is riches, studied it is wisdom, trusted it is salvation, loved it is character, and obeyed it is power. The word of God. The word of God, my friends. Where have we heard in this country the word of God being asked to go to, to look for answers? For at times like this, what are they doing? They're seeking to shut us up. They're seeking to shut us up and to put the word of God out there in the trash. Look to something else for your salvation, for your deliverance from this. But today, my friends, the only thing that's going to deliver you is going to be the word of God. Because even if COVID-19 gets you, if you have the word of God in your heart and you have Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you're already free. You're going home. You have nothing to worry about. There's nothing, no fear. There's no anxiety. There's, there's no concern. Because God, my friend, is in control. Have you been going to it for answers? What am I reflecting in the past weeks to my family, to my friends, to my neighbors, to my co co-workers? Where is my help coming from to fight COVID-19? Now, you word of life, as we get into the the word, you word of life, students. Philippians 2, 16. Come on, Johanna, speak it out. Okay, turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians, Philippians chapter 2. And I will speed up as fast as I can go. So if my words start getting... It's a song. So, Philippians chapter 2, in order for us to get a little bit of context, first of all, let's remember how the book of Philippians was written. Paul was in jail. Okay, he wasn't under great conditions. Okay, in fact, he was wondering what was going to actually happen to his life. And, what, and it says in chapter 2, verse 13, we'll begin... For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Who is it who's working? God's working. God's working in us. I don't like this verse. Do all things without murmuring and disputings. I don't know about you, but it's so much easier to do that. It's so hard to be happy. It's so easy to complain. 
But do all things without murmuring and disputing that you may be blameless and harmless. Why are you going to do that? Why are you going to practice it? Why is it going to be part of your life so that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst, in the midst, a day-to-day life in the midst of a cricket, crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Has this church been here in vain? Is the purpose for this church to be here so that a disease can cause the word of God to stop being put out in our community? He says here, holding forth the word of life. The idea is to hold out or to be stretching forth my hands like an offering. This is how the word is to be coming from God's people. It is the word of life. Notice that. It is the word of life. The only thing that we got in this world that's going to save us, that's going to help us, that's going to make a difference in our life is going to be the word of life. The word which is life and brings life. And we need to hold it forth. And we need to hold it forth through the way that we act and the way that we behave and the way that we live, the way that we handle this situation. We need to handle it in the fact that the world that's around us cannot go and rebuke us because of our murmurings and disputings, because of our failure to stand for what we believe in for our desires to not go where, and do what God wants us to do. Now, I have a word of testimony, because, you know, I'll be honest, these things, they just happen to me. Okay? They just happen. So I don't do anything for them to come about. They just happen. So I'm working, building a deck, for a regular client, he walks up to me and he goes and he says, Kev, I got a question for you. Okay, I'm thinking it's about a deck. <laughs> what do you want to change now? <laughs> That's just my everyday thing. He goes, my daughter's been really exploring faith and put her faith in God. And she fell down and really hurt her arm bad. And we've been hearing her the last few days blaming God, saying that God doesn't like her because of this. And it's really bothering me and my wife. What would you suggest we tell her? True story. I did nothing. I did absolutely nothing. But there's the opportunity to hold forth the word of life. Because that young girl needed to know who Jesus Christ was. And I pray, and you can pray with me, that I will get an opportunity to challenge her dad, to ask her dad, is he being the testimony and the example, holding forth that word of life, for his two daughters. See, if you want to be fighting COVID-19, you need to be holding forth the word of life, trusting in God, leaning on him, believing I'm being held securely, I go forth into the world. I'm not saying be dumb. I'm not saying don't take advice Put a grain of salt with it. Do what needs to be done. But don't stop 
preaching the word of God through the life that you live. Be out there. How can the word go forth if we aren't there? Secondly, not only do we need to be holding forth the word of life, but we need to be holding fast the faithful word. Holding fast the faithful word. Turn over to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. And here we find the tight Paul has come, the Isle of Cree. He's gone, he's preached the word. There's been a there's been a moving of God. People have been saved. People are coming under the word. He leaves Titus here to begin to establish them in their faith. He knows the enemy's going to come. He knows that he's going to try to destroy. He says, here's what I need you to tell these people. He says down in verse 9 of Titus chapter 1, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. Titus was given a responsibility. So we had the word of life, grads, holding forth the word of life. Now we have the MBBI grads, holding fast the faithful word. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, holding it fast. That means to be steady. That mean, the idea is to take a firm grip on the reliable, trustworthy word of God. Remember that picture of the frog and the stork? And it has a, a caption on the bottom, never give up. And it shows the frog's legs and the stork's mouth. But the frog has its front arms out around the stork's neck. So the stork can't swallow them. And my friends, never give up. Be holding fast. Why? Because it's the faithful word. It's the faithful word. God's word, we can hold fast to it. Because it's the word of life. But we can also hold fast, be our holding forth because it's the word of life, but be holding fast because it's the faithful word. Churchill, as I've used as an example many times, used to like bulldogs. And the reason he loved bulldogs when asked was because when a bulldog locks its jaw, you cannot open its mouth. No one humanly can open its mouth without breaking its jaw when it chooses to lock its jaw. That is the idea here of taking a firm grip on the faithful word. Has God left you? Has God forsaken you? Has God given up on us? No. You see, am I trusting in the words of man or am I trusting in the words of God? God is faithful. He will never leave you or forsake you. He has promised those who trust in him an abundant life. And the third thing today is holding faith in a good conscience. So I need to be holding forth the word of life. I need to be holding fast the faithful word. And I need to be holding faith in a good conscience. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 9. Timothy's going through a real difficult time here. Paul's placed him in a church. The church leadership is, is turn, starting to turn on them. There's, de there's deceivers and backbiters coming in amongst them. People are trying to change the truth that Timothy's trying to teach. And Paul goes and he says, we'll back up to verse 18. He says, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good war warfare, holding faith in a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Notice verses 9 and 10 of chapter 1. Paul says to Timothy, knowing this, 
that the law is not made for a righteous man, for the lawless, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other that is contrary to sound doctrine or sound teaching. What are the purposes of the law? They're for those who disobey the law. What's the purpose of the word of God? To strengthen those who want to live a godly life. Are we turning to that word? The word of God is our instruction, is our instruction manual. Jesus Christ is our chief, our captain, our source of faith. The Holy Spirit is our communication link. Over in John chapter 1, and if you'll just turn quickly over there. In John chapter 1, we read verse 1, In the beginning, before anything was here on this earth, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning. With God, all things were made by Him, and, with it, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In verse 14, it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who is the Word? The Word is Jesus Christ. And if we go over to John chapter 17, and here's Jesus praying to the Father, he says in verse 15 in John chapter 17, I pray not that thou shouldest take them, referring to his disciples, out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Keep them from turning from the word. Keep them from turning from the things that they've been taught. Keep them from depending upon man, but begin to turn them towards depending upon God. They are not of the world even as I am not of the world. Do you think about that this morning when you got up? You're not of this world. You're of a different world because God dwells in you. He dwells in your heart. He lives in you. Therefore, you are not of this world. You're of a different world. And you should represent that world and you should look like that world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The word of God. Are we looking to the word at times like these? The hymn writer put it this way. If you're fortunate enough to be as old as I am, you'll realize what some of these hymns are. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? When the clouds unfold their wings of strife, when the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchor drift or firm remain? Will your anchor hold in the straits of fear? When the breakers roar and the reef is near, when the surges rage and the wild winds blow, shall the angry waves then your bark overflow? Will your anchor hold in the floods of death? When the water's cold chill your light, light, latest breath, on the rising tide you can never fail. Will your anchor holds within the veil? Will your eyes behold through the morning light? the city of gold, and the harbor bright? Will you anchor safe by the heavenly shore when life storms are past forevermore? We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded, Firm and deep in the Savior's love. God loves every one of us. God does not want harm to come to any of us. But God has placed us here 
for a time like this. And it's up to us to ask ourselves, who am I looking to for the answer to COVID-19? Who am I looking to for the answers of how I should live my life? Who am I looking to to be that light and that testimony to the world that's around me? Let us pray. Father, we do thank you for the fact that you gave us your word because it is God-breathed that came directly from you and it is to help us in our day-to-day -day life. It is the source of truth. It is the source of life. It is the source of love. It is the source of direction. And without it, we are helpless and we are hopeless. I pray, God, today for our leadership that they would recognize the fact that they need to open this book just as some of the kings, as we read in the Old Testament, did. And they found the law, and they found the truth, and they brought your people back. And this nation right now has drifted far from you. And I pray that we, are, we be the light, we be the salt in this world that we live in. And might we be holding forth the word of life. We, might we be holding fast to your faithful word. And might we be holding faith and a good conscience before those who look upon us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.